All right, today it is my goal to fix your conflicts. I know it's a lofty goal, but I'm up for the challenge because I know full well how damaging it can be to your romantic relationships in particular when little things are turning into big fights for seemingly no reason, or you've stopped fighting altogether, but you've also stopped talking and connecting, haven't you? And you're just existing as roommates and the passion and intimacy that you used to have feels like it's drying up. And I have to warn you, I'm going to hit you with a lot of information today. This will be overwhelming for some of you, others of you, it'll be right up your alley. But if you can just take a few key points that resonated with you and actually implement them, it can change everything. One person can interrupt the negative cycles that we're going to talk about. One person can positively affect the relationship. One person cannot single-handedly bring connection and closeness back into the relationship. That takes both of you being on board. Healing hinges on both of you agreeing to self-reflect and take accountability and practice empathy and curiosity again. If you don't have any interest in doing that, then you don't actually have an interest in loving your partner or experiencing connection with them. Because conflict is a normal and natural part of every relationship. You're going to disagree. You're going to eventually unintentionally hurt each other. One or both of you will eventually feel dismissed, neglected, or disrespected. That's a given. But how you handle those moments is a choice. And it's a choice that affects everything about your future together. We think avoiding conflict at all costs is the goal, but the interesting fact is conflict is actually necessary for intimacy. Conflict isn't bad, it's neutral. We make it bad when we mishandle it, but there's actually an appropriate way to navigate it with respect and empathy and curiosity that actually leads to the passion and connection you say you want with each other. And some people will say, yeah, but Jimmy, my partner has no interest in listening or validation or sacrificing for me. I mean, I get what you're saying, but it just doesn't apply to me because they don't care about this stuff. What am I supposed to do? Here's what I had to learn the hard way. Connection and closeness don't happen by accident, right? They require certain things, certain environments to exist, and you won't feel close to someone if you don't feel like they care about how you feel loved. Plain and simple. I don't know what that means for your future, but I know that Connection is impossible unless we get conflict right together. So that's what I want to help you out with today. So let's get started with the first pillar of fixing your conflicts. You have to have a culture of appreciation and affection in your relationship. Dr. Sue Johnson said, when marriages fail, it is not increasing conflict that is the cause. It is decreasing affection and emotional responsiveness. The demise of the marriage begins with a growing absence of responsive, intimate, interactions. And you might say, what does affection have to do with conflict? Everything. Because when your love tank hasn't been full for years, when your emotional bank account is only getting withdrawals instead of deposits, of course you're fighting all the time because you don't feel valued or loved anymore. Just think about back when you were dating or newly married. You had an atmosphere of appreciation and admiration for each other, didn't you? You didn't need to be reminded to send her that sweet text. You didn't need to be reminded to show up to his job and surprise him with lunch and a kiss in front of his jealous coworkers. You did that stuff naturally. You complimented each other more. You looked out for ways to remind them you were grateful for each other. You appreciated them. You touched each other. You were responsive. You were intimate and not just in the bedroom. Your relationship was rich with positive affirmations for each other. You wrote notes to each other. You texted each other sweet things. You reminded them, I can't wait to see you. I'm lucky to have you. So my question is, why'd you stop? I know why I stopped, because those feelings of butterflies wore off. I got complacent. We both just kind of stopped doing those little things for each other because work got in the way, kids got in the way, stress got in the way, right? And yet when you're both sitting in the counseling office like we were, you're going to admit how you miss that affection and appreciation that you used to have. The couples that thrive, the research shows, are the couples that intentionally make deposits into each other's emotional bank accounts through affection and gratitude and looking out for ways to remind each other, I love you. I'm so glad we're doing this together. Thank you for showing up in the ways you do. The couples that make it look out for ways to serve each other and sacrifice for each other in the ways their partner feels loved most. The couples that make it prioritize checking in with each other and prioritizing emotional responsiveness. If you haven't felt that for years, 
It doesn't take a genius to realize why you're fighting all the time. All right, the second pillar is just like you have to have a culture of appreciation and affection, you have to create a safe place for your partner to be honest and vulnerable about any unmet needs or hurts or feelings or complaints. There's just no option where there can be intimacy or connection in this relationship and then feel unsafe chronically to bring up their feelings, needs, or concerns. It just doesn't exist. And here's the problem. In 80% of relationships, it's lopsided, meaning one partner primarily brings up the vast majority of the concerns or feelings, usually the woman, but not always. And the other partner has this attitude of, why can't we just exist together? Why do we need to bring these things up? I mean, don't you feel like you're making too big a deal about this? And I can just tell you if that's your attitude towards someone who is trying to share their inner world, then that's like pouring gasoline on the fire. Now they're going to do one of two things. One, they're going to escalate because their fears and triggers around being abandoned and feeling alone and unheard and unloved are being activated. So they're going to get even more heated and say things like, you don't even care about me. You never listen to me. That's gonna trigger your shame and wounds around being seen as a failure or not being good enough. And you're gonna respond with, you're overreacting. Nothing I do is good enough for you. Does that dynamic sound familiar to anyone? Or two, they're gonna start shutting down. They're gonna lose trust that you're a safe place for them and stop bringing up their hurts or needs. And that might seem more peaceful for a little while, but the truth is you're losing them. And eventually you're gonna wake up one day and they'll be gone, and you won't know why. Dr. John Gottman says marriages die in the conversations that never happen. That's why. So let's break out of these cycles together. Step number one, have an intentional appreciation for each other, a rich environment of admiration. Be on the lookout for ways that they're showing up. Express gratitude out loud. Fill their love tank through serving them and affection. Step number two, you have to provide at least some space. We can debate on how much is too much, but it's not zero. You have to provide some space where your partner feels safe to have a need or complaint without you punishing them for that. A healthy relationship can handle the occasional complaint or negative feeling. If I were you and you're watching this with your partner, admit out loud, I want you to feel safe to bring up your inner world and feel seen, heard, and understood. You deserve that. I want you to feel like I'm on your team and that you can rely on me. And on the flip side, for the person who tends to bring up the vast majority of the complaints or feelings, you need to admit out loud, thank you for providing that space. I want to bring up my feelings and needs in a respectful way without criticism, blame, or passive aggressiveness or yelling at you. I don't want you to feel like I'm attacking you because I'm not. I just want to feel heard and close to you. Julie Manano says in her book, Secure Love, every time we snap, defend, shut down, push away, get cynical, sarcastic, use passive aggressive humor or call names, it is a misguided attempt to say, hear me, feel some of my pain so you know how much this hurts. I need to feel safe right now. And this isn't meant to justify those actions or words. It's meant to expose them for what they are. Your criticism and defensiveness has a purpose. And the purpose is protecting yourself from pain, but it's also to reconnect with your partner. We're saying, hey, this hurts. Please care about my pain. But we need to remind each other these are misguided attempts that are actually causing more pain. So what can we do instead? We can establish a standard right now. We can create an agreement in our relationship that we're going to practice being vulnerable and we're going to practice holding space for our partner's vulnerability with listening and understanding and empathy. This will not be easy for you because both of you in different ways have reinforced the idea to each other. I'm not a safe place to share your feelings or needs with, or I'm just out to attack you and call you a failure. You need to remind each other. I want to know your heart. I want both of us to practice being vulnerable and holding space for each other. That's the only way we can heal together. We replace the old bad habits that made us want to escalate or shut down with calm, safe conversations where we can slowly start to lower our armor that we've put up over the years and begin to trust each other again. This isn't a one-time process. It's done over months and months of two steps forward and one step back. Connection, disconnection, repair, repeat. You don't have to get this right perfectly. You just have to get this right consistently. Show your partner you're committed to trying something new. Your relationship essentially lives and dies based on whether you can have these difficult conversations with each other and maintain a sense of connection and closeness through mutual respect and empathy. It's not optional. It's essential. All right, third pillar of fixing our conflicts, identify actual feelings and needs. We can all struggle with identifying feelings and needs, especially for men. Identifying feelings seems like a waste of time, right? It feels weak to even have feelings. But the reality is your body will feel your feelings 
regardless of whether you identify them or not. Your suppressed feelings don't go away, they just come out in other destructive ways, like rage, or resentment, or addiction, or alcoholism, or anxiety, or avoidance. It's way healthier for you to actually become in touch with what you're feeling. That doesn't make you weak. That makes you emotionally intelligent. And especially for the people who have anxious attachment, where you think you're being vulnerable and honest because you're the one that's bringing up what you're feeling, but what you're really saying is, you never touch me. You never help me around the house. You never take me out anywhere. I feel like you don't even care. But within all that vulnerability, you didn't actually mention one feeling or need. So stop saying you're being honest and vulnerable when you're not actually being respectful or mature in what you're actually needing or feeling, right? I know it's scary, but this is a necessary skill we have to learn in this relationship or the next one. So here's a list of common feelings that we need to start using when we're being vulnerable. Supported, loved, accepted, safe, valued, ashamed, embarrassed, humiliated, rejected, neglected, abandoned, frustrated, angry, disrespected, afraid, overwhelmed, worried, confused, pressured, blamed, lonely, unheard, sad, hurt, misunderstood, hopeless, disconnected, inadequate. Let's actually start practicing using these feelings in day-to-day -day language and especially when we're being vulnerable. Things are going to come up day-to-day. -day. Something's going to happen and we're going to feel overlooked or dismissed. It's essential that we can say, hey, when this happened, I felt dismissed. And the story I'm telling myself is that you really don't care. Can we talk about it? Or when you get defensive and invalidate my feelings, I feel really hurt and disconnected and scared that you don't really care about what I need to feel loved in this relationship. I can understand that that seems overwhelming and vulnerable. And of course, we need to have some discernment with how and when we bring things up. But the reason we eventually break up or fight constantly is because so often we're not being honest about what we're actually feeling and we just shove it down. We often dismiss our own feelings and needs before our partner even does. So just like we did with feelings, let's go over some top needs in a relationship. These are what we're so often fighting for without saying what we need more of. Respect, safety, trust, consideration, intimacy, equality, affection, appreciation, independence. Having these needs is not wrong. We all have needs. Now, I will admit some needs can be unhealthy, like the need for constant reassurance or control or avoiding conflict or intimacy altogether. But the point is, if we ever want closeness with another person, we have to learn about what they need to feel loved and valued in this relationship. Just think about the opposite. Would a relationship work if your partner didn't take any accountability when they messed up? Or they rarely, if ever, apologized or they didn't care about how their words and actions affected you? Would you feel close to someone who had no desire for you? Me neither. So let's at least admit we need certain things in a relationship. And during a conflict, don't forget to remember you're supposed to be on the same team. We fight for a reason, because we want to feel seen, heard, and understood. We want to communicate something. Usually that behavior hurt me, or I need this to feel close to you. Ask yourself, what am I fighting for in my conflicts? Is it respect? Is it appreciation? Is it affection? Is it equality? Is it independence? Let's at least start admitting that. And if you're in a fight with your partner, you should be asking yourself, what are they fighting for? What are they needing right now? How can I explore that? All right, the fourth pillar of fixing our conflicts is learning how to express yourself with respectful vulnerability. And we've already touched on it numerous times, but you need to come up with a framework for how to begin having hard discussions. We've already established that we're both trying to intentionally fill each other's love tanks. We're trying to provide a safe place for a partner to share their inner world, especially their negative emotions. And they've agreed to remove criticism, blame, shame, yelling, or passive aggressiveness because those things don't help anything. They only hurt your hopes and goals because your goal is to feel heard and understood, right? Your hope is that they move in your direction. Your hope is that your pain is validated as real, or they see that a certain behavior is hurting you or for them to listen to you when you have an unmet need. But we can't achieve any of those goals if we lead with criticism or contempt or accusations. You never do this. You always do that. You're so lazy. I knew you didn't care about me. The truth is that's just our own immaturity trying to protect us from actually being vulnerable and simply stating what we feel and need to feel close to them. So instead, we're going to talk about what happened. We're not going to bring things up that happened a year ago to shame them. We're using this formula. When this happened, 
or when that didn't happen, I'm feeling X. And this is the story I'm telling myself. I've been doing the dishes every night for this week. I'm feeling pretty dismissed. And the story I tell myself is that you don't care that I'm stuck doing the lion's share of this task. And that makes me sad and frustrated. Notice how I didn't blame you for how I'm feeling. I simply stated what I'm feeling and why. Because the truth is, underneath all of our fights are hidden feelings and needs. Our job is to reflect and take responsibility to express them clearly. And as their partner, your job is to listen out for feelings and needs hidden underneath the frustrations or complaints. Remember, we want them to feel safe to express their inner world, and occasionally, they're probably gonna misstep a little bit. Maybe they don't actually mention a feeling and they say, I can't believe you made that joke about me at the party, that was so insensitive. Our job is to listen for the hurt underneath. And instead of getting defensive and saying, it was just a joke, are you serious? We say, it sounds like you're really hurt and I certainly didn't intend to hurt you. Can we talk about this? And that should help your partner to choose not to escalate and instead switch to a more vulnerable option where they say, yeah, I was so hurt. That probably wasn't your intention, but I felt really abandoned in that moment. The story I told myself is that you don't even care how your words affect me, and that hurts so bad. It scared me to think that you could forget about me like that. And then we hold space for that, and we say, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you so much for telling me. You're right, it wasn't my intent to hurt you, but I can see how I was careless with my words, and that did hurt you. And I don't want that for you. I promise I'm going to be more careful with my words. I'm so sorry. The truth is, it's easier to say, you never want to spend any time with me. You're always working or you're on your phone. Everything revolves around you. Than saying, I'm scared that you don't want to spend time with me. I miss you. It fills my love tank so much when you used to plan those dates together and you haven't done that for a while and it just hurts. I feel lonely, maybe a little rejected. Like work is more important than this relationship to you. Isn't it fascinating that we mean the same thing in both of those statements? We're simply looking for them to move in our direction and see our pain and listen to our hurt and prioritize us in the ways we feel loved most. But only one of those statements has the chance of that happening. And it's not the one where we accuse them. Criticism and blame seem like a shield that will protect us from being rejected or hurt. But they actually set us up for a lower chance of being heard and understood. All right, so here are a few vulnerability guidelines that I want you to keep in mind. Lead with the most generous assumption when possible. Don't make generalizations or accusations. You never, you always, you don't care. Exchange criticisms for requests. You never touch me becomes, I feel so loved when you touch me. Would you do that for me more? If you feel yourself getting critical or blaming, just stop and say, hey, I think that came across a little blaming. Can I start over? And if you're on the other side and your partner starts out accusatory or critical, you can say, hey, can we just talk about what you're feeling and needing? Because I want to understand you right now. And just as a reminder, they are allowed to not solve this issue right here and now. If they need space, that's okay. But they need to be the one to plan when this conversation will take place in the future. And if you're the type that complains a lot, you need to throttle it back and practice some discernment. If you're the type that shoves it all down, you need to be more in touch with what you're actually needing and feeling and have the courage to bring it up more. And your partner needs to encourage that courage by saying, I want you to share when something's bothering you. That's what leads to healing and connection. Repetitive moments where you used to be scared to bring something up, but this time you try and reach for them and they turn towards you instead of against you and hold you and hear you. That's when your body says, this is different and I like this. All right, final thoughts on expressing. It makes sense why you're scared to be vulnerable. I heard someone say recently, we're wired for connection, but when we have trauma in our lives, it rewires our brain for protection. We're scared to be vulnerable because we are protecting ourselves, most likely because of our past. Being vulnerable didn't lead to us feeling safe, seen, or heard. Why would we want to go through that again? But the solution isn't to avoid. And the solution isn't attacking them before they can attack us. The solution is honoring that little girl or little boy that's still inside of you that wasn't safe and reminding them that they are safe now. Because we can't afford not to be vulnerable. We can't afford to have these walls up anymore, to shut off our emotions or just shut down completely. There are certain people in our lives, if they're trustworthy, where we want connection and closeness with them. And those walls don't serve us anymore. We can do both, be vulnerable and set healthy boundaries. That's still kindness. Now, just because you are vulnerable, does that mean that they're gonna respond the way we want them to? No. 
We can't control anyone else's reactions or behavior. They might still take what you say as an attack. They might still go on the defensive and invalidate and dismiss your feelings. We can't prevent that. All we can do is show up as the best, most mature version of ourselves. And I'm telling them, defensiveness kills your connection. Invalidation pushes your partner away. We defend and dismiss because of our own shame. We think they're calling us a failure, when really they might just be saying, I'm opening up my heart to you and showing you the parts of me that I don't show other people because I want to trust you. All right, fifth pillar is learning how to validate our partner even if I don't agree with their feelings. Let's start with what validation is. Validation is simply acknowledging that their feelings and experience is real and important to you. If someone shares an actual feeling, like I feel overwhelmed, anxious, hurt, sad, angry, disconnected, embarrassed, it's not our job to convince them that they shouldn't feel that way. Those feelings are real to them. Feelings are signals that happen in our body and they are happening for a reason. And while I can agree that we should challenge our thoughts and assumptions that might have formed our feelings, right? It's also true that so often we don't choose to feel our feelings. They just happen to us. And sometimes the best way to challenge our feelings is when someone we love first validates them and says, hey, I care about what you're experiencing. Let's explore this together as a team because I love you. That's validating. When someone accepts you and acknowledges that what you're feeling is at least real to you, that helps calm your nervous system. We validate our partner because it's someone who we're supposed to love, right? This is someone who we're supposed to trust. When they say they're feeling hurt or rejected, it's not our job to dismantle the facts of how they came to that conclusion so we don't have to feel any responsibility. Maybe they weren't blaming you for their feelings. They were simply sharing them. You have the opportunity to move towards them in this moment instead of away from them by saying, tell me what led you to feel that way. I care about what's going on. That's validating. Invalidation, on the other hand, always results in worse disconnection. That would sound like you're so sensitive. Oh my gosh, not this again. Stop being so dramatic. You're making a big deal about nothing. You're imagining things. You're so negative. Just get over it already. Oh, okay. I guess I can't do anything right. I'm just a terrible person. Plus, your feelings aren't my problem. Or invalidation could just be silence. Someone telling you something vulnerable and you're just rolling your eyes or refusing to pay attention or mocking them with a laugh. Those things push our partner away. It shames them for having feelings and it makes them feel abandoned and alone and less likely to ever feel safe with us. Validating phrases, on the other hand, sound like this. I don't want you to feel that way. Tell me about what's going on. Or, yeah, I can see how you would feel that way. Or, your experience matters to me. Thank you for being able to share it with me. Or, that makes sense. I can totally see that. I want to make this right. It's not about getting the words perfect. It's about the energy behind them. Even just making eye contact and nodding when they're talking to you about something that's important to them is validating. It shows them, I care. I'm engaged. Summarizing what they said is also validating. You say, okay, I want to get this right. So, when this happened, you felt rejected. And this is what you needed in that moment from me. Did I get that right? We validate our partner because they matter to us. We can't validate without first listening to what they're telling us. Give them the floor. Let them express themselves. Don't interrupt. Don't look for ways to correct them so you can prove that they shouldn't feel that way. Just listen intentionally. Engage. Nod. Match their emotion. If they, if they seem sad, you seem sad. This isn't about being fake. It's not manipulating them. It's trying to empathize with someone you love who is trying to share something important to you about their inner world. That's how love is demonstrated. Listening to understand what are they feeling? What are they needing? Empathizing with their pain and taking accountability for any unintentional hurt. You'll get your turn to talk. You'll get your turn to share your experience, but be mature enough in this moment to give them this moment. Show them they're a priority because they're the ones that brought it up. And if you forget everything else, remember this. The thing every single person in this world wants the most when they are hurting or in pain is for the people who are closest to them to move in their direction, to be a safe place for them to open up about their experience and try to understand them instead of judging or dismissing them. Now, it is important to note, I'm not saying validate accusations or blame. Just because their feelings are valid doesn't mean their behavior is. If they say, you never help me around the house, you're such a self-centered narcissist, how could you be so stupid? Validation isn't, you're right, I'm awful. Validation doesn't mean shame spiraling or agreeing with their accusations. If my wife said something like, you never do this, you don't care, you're so lazy, I would gently remind her, I'm willing to have this conversation about what she's feeling or needing, but I can't do that if she's just going to accuse or criticize me. Here's the hardest part. When we've had some trauma in our lives, which we all have, 
One symptom is that you're very sensitive to shame. So if you're the partner who gets defensive easily, maybe you have a tendency to defend yourself or dismiss their feelings, you invalidate them, but it's just because you feel unfairly blamed and attacked, right? Here's my advice for you. If your partner tosses you a criticism, you can practice by saying, ooh, man, that hurts. I kind of feel defensive right now, but I don't think it was your goal to attack or blame me. Can we back up and talk about what you're feeling and what your intention was for bringing this up? because I want to understand you. Is that hard to do in the moment? Absolutely, but it's both of our jobs to interrupt the cycle, right? It takes two to fight. And once someone starts lobbing criticisms or accusations, those are signals that the conflict is turning into a fight and there needs to be an intervention now. This takes a lot of self-reflection, I get that, but it's possible. Defending ourselves, dismissing them, or shutting down isn't going to help anything. And you might have good reasons for why you shut down. We think our words are gonna get used against us, right? We think talking is only gonna make things worse. This person is being aggressive and we don't know what else to do. We're just waiting for this uncomfortable moment to pass so we don't say anything. But at the end of the day, shutting down only perpetuates the disconnection, right? It doesn't lead to the closeness that I want for you. So what can we do instead of shutting down? We have to start being aware of what shutting down feels like in our bodies, right? And then we take a break when that happens because it's not immature to say, hey, I need a break. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm having trouble listening to you in the way that you deserve to be listened to. Can we just take a 30 minute break and come back to this? Once again, we can't control how someone might respond. They might accuse you of being immature and just leaving the conversation, but you know that's not what's happening. You're actually doing a very mature thing, recognizing that your nervous system is triggered and that means you're not really present in the way that you need to be. The only thing that solves that is calming our nervous system through taking some deep breaths and taking some time to relax. All right, final thoughts on validation. Nothing feels safer to your partner than when they've had the courage to say something really hard like, hey, what you did or didn't do hurt me. And you can actually stay grounded instead of immediately jumping to defensiveness or dismissing them. And you say, I wanna know how you're feeling. In an unhealthy dynamic, we don't want to know about their pain because it triggers our own wounds of not being enough. Our shame gets triggered, and even if they use all the right words and they're actually vulnerable with us, we still think we messed up, they think we're a failure, and if we don't prove them wrong, then it's going to be confirmed that I'm a failure or the relationship is going to be in jeopardy. So you're actually defending yourself because you deeply care how this person views you. Start being vulnerable and actually saying that. All right, sixth pillar of resolving conflict. Let's briefly talk about boundaries because we should want to know our partner's boundaries. We shouldn't want our partner to feel overextended or neglected or uncomfortable or pressured. We cannot experience closeness and connection with someone if we don't care about their boundaries. And setting healthy boundaries around conflict is about communicating my standards and needs. It's not about controlling the other person. Personally, I have a boundary around name calling and yelling. So if I'm in a disagreement with someone and they call me a name, I'm going to leave that conversation for 30 minutes. That's just my boundary. It requires nothing from the other person. I'm going to enforce my boundary whether they agree with it or not. Now, some people will say, ah, but you can't set boundaries with a narcissist because they won't respect them. And I agree. And yet, what do we all agree is the only solution to getting out of a narcissistic relationship? Going no contact, right? Going no contact is the perfect example of a boundary. They don't need to agree with why you're going no contact for you to enforce and uphold it. If someone tries to argue with your feelings, as long as it's safe, you can say, my feelings aren't up for debate. Or you can say nothing because you know that arguing with someone who has no capacity or emotional intelligence is pointless. And while it's very sad that you most likely won't experience any intimacy with this person due to their immaturity, that's still the reality. And there's no point in trying to convince someone that you're allowed to feel hurt or scared or disconnected. All right, the last pillar of fixing your conflicts is accountability and repairing old hurts. Once we're breaking out of our cycles, once we're fixing our conflicts again, I believe it's necessary for us to take accountability for our hurtful words and actions in the past and do what we can to repair that. Let's say you used to yell because you felt so unheard. Maybe you were critical, maybe you called them names in the past. And sure, in your head, you've justified it a million times because they were worse or they provoked you or whatever it is. Simply take responsibility for how you used to show up in hurtful ways. Say, it makes sense why you jumped to defensiveness in the past. I wasn't actually being vulnerable with you. I was using a lot of criticism and blame and that was wrong. I'm sorry. I bet that left you feeling pretty unappreciated or unfairly attacked. Like I was looking out for ways you were messing up so I could label you as a failure. I certainly don't want that to be your experience. 
I want you to feel appreciated and valued in this relationship. I'm open to hearing about how that impacted you. And if you used to get defensive or shut down or punish their vulnerability when they brought up their feelings, if you said things like, stop being so sensitive, stop making everything an issue, your feelings aren't my problem, you need to know that those words caused major damage in the relationship. There's a lot of legitimate hurt and you need to repair that. That would sound like this. In the past, I was defensive and dismissive of your feelings. I would shut down because I felt so overwhelmed and I felt attacked, but I realized that you weren't trying to shame me. You were trying to tell me how you felt loved and valued. And I can see now that when I shut down or when I would defend myself, that left you feeling abandoned and alone. And I'm so sorry, that was wrong. It makes sense why you didn't feel safe to be vulnerable, but I wanna change that. I wanna do everything I can to repair that and learn how to show up for you because that's what you deserve. This is what helps rebuild trust in the relationship. It's not only about doing the right things going forward, it's about acknowledging old hurts and actually inviting your partner to share their experience so we can process them and validate them and repair them together. That's what gives them the confidence to actually trust you again. In order to have a mutually fulfilling relationship, we need to be able to have the hard talks and we need to be able to navigate conflict together with mutual respect. And then we need to get on the same page before the conflict even starts. We need to come up with agreements and standards and boundaries and protocols before we get triggered and heated and emotionally charged. Trying to think about that stuff in the middle of a fight is too late. We need to be asking them, what does mutual respect during a conflict look like to you? What causes you to feel defensive or attacked? What helps you feel seen and heard? What can I do to help you feel valued and appreciated, especially during a conflict? Can we agree to take a break once there's any yelling or name calling? Can we agree that if one of us says we need to take a break, then we can't argue with that? Can we agree not to fight in front of kids or extended family? And if I were you in the beginning of this process, have a code word or a code phrase like, Hey, can I talk to you about something that's on my heart? And that's your cue, that this isn't just a normal conversation. This might be one of those hard talks where someone's gonna bring up a hurt or a feeling. Let's train ourselves to not let that terrify us. We don't need to be scared. We just need to follow the rules. Hey, when this happened, here's what I'm feeling. On the other side, I'm exploring their hurt by listening and practicing compassionate curiosity and trying to understand their perspective because they matter to me. I'm defaulting to listening instead of defensiveness because I know that helps them feel safe and connected. And one of you is usually gonna struggle with being vulnerable more than the other. So if, if you see your partner struggling, you say, it kind of feels like you're overwhelmed with all these questions. Would you say that's accurate? They're probably gonna say, yeah. And we can say, that makes sense. I would feel overwhelmed too if I were you. That's still being empathetic. That's validating and building trust with your partner. And hopefully they'll use that to build up the courage to continue to try to be vulnerable because without vulnerability, we won't have actual intimacy. Thank you so much for listening. I know it was a long one. I can't wait to see you in the next one.